Pastor, as she comes to bring the word of God, give her a hearty amen. Well, that's always exciting, isn't it? Yes, I've never been to a church where I got a thousand dollars. We're glad that we could do it for you. It has always been a dream of mine to honor our military. Having been a military wife for 20 plus years, I know all the sacrifices that are made with the military families, traveling when you don't feel like it, sitting in a place waiting to be shipped overseas with a whole bunch of Holland babies. I remember the first time we went, we were in, um, oh, I'm trying to think. I can't think of the Air Force Base now, but 
we were gonna fly out from there. It's supposed to fly, supposed to have flown out at midnight, and we were there until five or six the next morning. And you never heard such hollering kids in your life. I had my own, they were asleep, thank God, but it was just so much noise. Soldiers can sleep anywhere. I looked across the across the seats uh, in the in the place where we were setting the fly out. Those old soldiers were sleeping like they were on a full bed, comfortable, head laid back, uh, snoring and everything else. I thought that's what it is to be a soldier. I couldn't sleep like that. In a public place, it didn't bother them one bit. I want you to know we appreciate your sacrifice and all that you do for our country. We appreciate it. You know, one time the Army was a volunteer uh, Army like it is today that you just volunteer and go in. And, and my husband had volunteered and he didn't get accepted for whatever reason. And then they finally drafted him. And I hated every minute of it because I thought, I don't want to be moving every time I look up. But I'm telling you, that's what happened. We were moving, moving, moving all the time. Trying to get settled with seven children is somewhat difficult. But I thank God for our military and all that you do every day. The families pay such a tremendous price having their husbands gone at odd hours of the night. And in Germany, when they would, when they would blow the siren in the, in, the, in the housing area for them to go to the post, because there was an alert, honey, you never seen such a loud sound in your life. I think if you weren't good and dead, you'd wake up. That's how loud it was. And uh, we were, we're just thankful to God for how he has taken you through and helped you to make the sacrifices and it's time you give something back to him because he's honored you he's blessed your life and if you've been to if you've already been to combat you know what it feels like to be away and to be in harm's way and God is so good to bring you back again and let you participate. A lot of people went, didn't come back. We had friends to go that didn't come back. So I'm telling you, it's a miracle if you go to war and come back. And come back complete. So many of our servicemen come back uh, wounded and limbs missing and brain damage and all these things. What a sacrifice. We in this country should never forget that. Never forget it. And sometimes they come back home and they're never the same. And we got to remember them. Some of them took their own lives after getting back from so much pressure and stress that they've gone through. We cannot let that go unrewarded. We wish we could do it for every soldier there is. But we're glad you came this morning. I enjoy at the end of the year they give me a book with all of your pictures in there. And, 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 and with each picture, there is something that you wrote about the program. Very inspiring to me, and I love sitting in my bed reading. I don't know some of these people I'll never see again, but we're thankful that you're here today. Please come back and be with us at other services. We'd love for you to come. We have the heart for the military, and we thank God for you. God bless you is my prayer. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the 15th chapter of St. John. Father, we're so grateful this morning for your blessings. We thank you because you were good to us. You loved us, God, when nobody else did. You understood us when nobody else understood. We thank you, God, because you're our father. You are our friend. You are our savior. You are everything that we would ever need in this life. I pray for our military, the families, that you would be with them. God, that you would help them to make the sacrifice they have to make. Remember those this morning that's in harm's way, fighting for this country and the freedom of others. And we thank you for it today. I pray, God, for the anointing upon thy servant. For without you, I can't do nothing. With you, I can do anything and will give you glory. Glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Yes, the 20th verse says, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And if they have kept my saying, they, all, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they knew not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. I want just a minute. I want to preach to you a little while. There's no more cloak for anybody to cover under. Ever since Jesus came, he took that away. 
He said, if I had come, they didn't even know they were sinning. But once he came and spoke the word to them and told them what they should be doing and how their lives should be lived every day, now you know the difference. Now you're held accountable. Now you have to answer for that. You know what? I think from coming up as a girl, I didn't get a whooping for things that I didn't know were bad. When I found out it was bad and they told me it was bad, I didn't go back and do it again. If I did, I got a whooping for it. So I say to you this morning, no matter where you at today, God has already made provision for all of us. Have you not heard people say, well, everybody sin, everybody have sin. All of us at some point in our life committed sin. But Jesus came and said, I want to take that away from you. So what he did, he took away the cloak, the excuses, if you will, saying that, okay, we can't do it by ourselves. He says, I know that. You know, from the beginning of time when God created Adam and Eve, remember, they did not have to sin. The scripture says he made man upright. He made him perfect. So Adam and Eve, from the beginning, was made perfect and upright. They didn't have any reason to sin because when you're perfect and you're made upright, you don't have to bow. But Adam and Eve decided we're going to do what God told us not to do. And he plainly made it plain to them. You can have everything in this garden. Help yourself to accept this one tree. Don't partake of that tree. What is it about people? You can be given everything that you can possibly think of, and at the same time, I want that over there. Why do you want that? Why do you want that? I want it because I'm not supposed to have it. See, all of us have experienced this in our lives, even as young people, young kids. As sure as they say, you can't have a cookie, we wanted a cookie. If they say you got to wait till after you eat dinner, we didn't want to wait till after dinner. We wanted to have it before. This type of nature that we are born with is the sinful nature. It always wants what it shouldn't have. It also wants everything that is not good for them. And God said, I made man. I know all about you. I understand your wants and your likes. I understand all these things. Now, follow what I tell you and you'll have a full life. You'll be happy. You'll be uh, rich in his mercy and his love. I'll make you happy every day of your life. So Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I want you to be happy. That is God's plan for all of us. How is it that we choose to choose things that can bring us pain and bring us unhappiness? But we still want it. It's, it's unbelievable how we go after things that's not good. We like things that we shouldn't like. We find ourselves in a position where all we're doing is just looking for other things to kind of fill the void in our lives. God fixed it where we wouldn't have a void. I'm going to give you everything you need. When the woman that met Jesus at the well, when she went there, she had a need. And when he tried to talk to her, at first she didn't want to talk to him because she was prejudiced. Said Jews don't have nothing to do with Samaritans. We don't have no dealings with you. But he kept talking to her until finally she began to listen. Have you ever had somebody start talking to you and then finally you started listening? Because at the beginning you thought, I don't need this. This is not what I'm looking for. But if you wait a minute and listen for a moment, you might do that to a preacher. You might do it to me. What is it? Get it on, get the show on the road. Look. Sit there for a minute. I guarantee you, you won't be here long. And just listen to what I'm saying. See? So he kept talking to her until he finally convinced her that this is what you need. And she said, well, who do you think you are? You're not greater than our fathers that came to this well. Who are you? He kept talking to her. And she, he wanted, he said, if you give me some water. She said, no, that's not going to happen. So he continued to talk to her in spite of it. And finally she said, who are you? And then she began to remember that she had been told that the Messiah was coming. But she didn't think he was the Messiah. She didn't think that. So now she's looking at the situation saying, uh, I don't really need this. He kept talking to her. 
I believe we as Christians need to keep talking. We need to let people hear. That they may, for a moment, find out exactly what it is. So, he asked her where her husband was. She said, I don't have a husband. He said, you've spoken right. You've had five, but ain't none of them yours. So, you really don't have a husband. So, you think this morning while you're in the building, okay. Am I one of those people that's got five different things in my life but really don't belong to me? What have I got in my life that, that I thought I needed? And I got this and I got that and I got the, all these things, but none of them really work. So when he got through talking to her, he said, the water I'll give you is better than the water that your forefathers had. The water I give you, you'll never thirst again. You will be so glad that you took it. Because man has an urgent thirst all the time for something, even though he's looking for it all in the wrong places. Hey, take a moment and say, you know what? She said, well, give me this water that I may drink, that I'll never thirst again. Are you kidding me? What kind of water is this? He gave it. He spoke to her and said, look, what I'm telling you, it will be like a well of water springing up in you. You will never be thirsty again. Give me this water that I may not thirst anymore. Look at your life this morning. What is it that you need to do? That you quit needing all these things to try to fill this void in your life. The void is too great. And it's, it's this big hole that we've tried to put everything and everybody into this hole. Except they don't fit. They don't fit. They don't change your life. You don't become better. So think about it this morning. He tells this lady, I'm going to give you this. And he began to tell her all the good things that would happen as a result of her life. And meeting Jesus makes the difference. You can meet a lot of people in your life, but nobody will do for you what he does. Nobody will feel that place like he feels it. It's not going to happen. I'm sure there's people all over this building. You say, I've had a few things going on in my life. Things, a thing I picked over here, something I picked over there, something I picked here because I really believe that those are the things that would make me feel whole and complete. And I don't need it from a person because people are there today and gone today. But I need something that's real, something that's stable, something that's going to always be there. Because as much as we love each other and care about each other, it's a known fact that we're all going to die. They're not always going to be there for you. And so you need the person who's going to always be there. He said, I'll be with you always. Even to the end of the world, I'll be there for you. You can't have this from everybody else. Because they're fragile just like you are. They're going to die just like you're going to die. So what do I have if you're gone tomorrow? If my mom is gone, if my dad's gone, if my husband or my wife is gone, what do I have? You've got to have more than what you got today. Something that's going to make a difference in whether you stay where you need to stay. I was watching the documentary this weekend uh, with uh, Anderson Cooper and his mother, um, what's her name? Va Gloria Vanderbilt. And I thought, what a tragedy. His brother. Anderson Cooper's brother that was two years older than he was. He looked to be so normal. He went to Stanford. He, he graduated. He had so much going for him. Um, his mother said he came in looking kind of dazed. And he went and took a nap. And after he took the nap, he got up and he was totally incoherent. And she said, she said, what's wrong, Carter? And he didn't answer her. And she said, he stood there for a minute like he didn't know where he was. And, and they had this apartment in New York City on the 17th floor. And she said, all of a sudden, he made a turn in the room and went directly toward the, toward the balcony. And she said, where are you going, Carter? Talk to me. He wouldn't look back, and she said she started toward him, and he put his hand out like, don't come over here. And she said she stood there watching him, and he said no. And she said he got up on this 
on the on the little uh, trim or step, whatever it was, on the balcony, and he got up on the other side, 17 floors up. And she said, she stood there and said, Carter, what are you doing? He never answered. So about that time, a plane came over in the air, and he looked up at the plane, and by this time, he is now on the other side of the wall holding on to that little thing there. And she said, Carter, please. She said he just turned his hand loose and fell 17 stories to his death. His mother watching all of this. What happened to this man? What made you feel like there was no reason to live? What made you want to take your life? I Meaning you can have any status in society you may think you need. But at the end of the day, if you don't have God, you have nothing. And my heart went out to them. It was such a sad ending for a young man who had great promise. But if you don't have God, what's going to keep you? For some reason, this man felt like he didn't need to live in spite of. He didn't talk to nobody about it. He didn't leave a suicide note, nothing. Anderson Cooper said, I never knew that he was in this place. And he would just take away his life in a moment. This morning, we have military people coming back from the war, survived the war, only to take their own lives after they get back. People, we need God. We can't make it by ourselves. And he has made a way for you. He has made a way so that you don't walk around and say, well, I can't help but be the way I am. I can't change me. I don't like this about me. I don't like that about me. But you can't. You can say, I can change it. Whatever's bothering you, whatever is a problem to you, he says, I can change that for you if you'll let me. All of us have some issues in our life that we didn't quite know how to deal with. But when you know you can take it to God because I've made things possible for you. If you keep sin in your life, you're always going to have a place of unhappiness, depression, all type of things that's not good for you. Sin produces bad things. But if we say, I want God in my life, I want to serve him and live for him. Then you don't have all these things that's pushing you to the edge and I can't take it no more. I'm at the end of the road. I want to say to you this morning, you cannot go anywhere in this whole country, in the world, where God is not. He's everywhere. He sees you in the dark. He sees you when you're doing things you shouldn't do. He sees the affair that you are having. He sees the people that you hurt. He's seen it all. He watches you day by day. And he says, I made it possible. See, at first you didn't know you were a sinner. At first you didn't even know you needed a savior. Except I came and took that off of you. Now you can see. Look, look, I'm telling you there's a better way. There's a better way. Sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalted the nation. Sin is destructive. It's a tragedy. I look around and you think, my God, all these people in the world, and the world is full of people, and yet you got people say, I feel alone. There's people everywhere. How do you feel alone, encompassed by all these people? Something's wrong inside. And he wants to change it for you. He wants to fulfill your life. He wants to give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. You can have all of that. See, I was a very unhappy person before I gave my life to the Lord. My husband was stationed in Germany, and the sun don't shine much over there. I thought, this is the most dreariest country i ever been in my life. Then your husband's gone away to training 30 days at a time, come back, go away again for another 14 days from one training exercise to another. And there you are in a foreign country where it's raining every day. And kids, you look out the window, it's just gray. It's just ugly. Uh, if you've ever been to Washington State, it is typical of Germany. 
You go to bed, it's raining, you get up, it's raining. You go to bed, it's raining, you get up, it's raining. Dreary. Even here in Colorado, it is amazing when the sky begins to turn blue and the sun is shining in its straight. You just feel like you want to do some things. But when it turns gray outside, it's like, I don't feel like getting up this morning. You know, I, I'm just not into it. It takes some sunshine. It takes a pretty blue sky. For you to say, wow, is this not a beautiful day? People come in my house all the time and say, it's beautiful out there. If I open my blinds in the morning and it's gray, I just want to close them back. Because there's nothing there that's really going to make me excited. That's how I feel like doing nothing. Sitting around doing nothing. What's wrong? I don't know. Yes, it's the weather. And many times it's more than the weather. You already got some issues. As long as we live, we're going to have clouds. We're going to have sunshine. We're going to have we're going to have rain. We're going to have snow. In Colorado, you really know that real fast. I thought I sent my coats away uh, so they could be put in storage, you know, because winter's done. Really? I got up this morning and said, do I have any winter coats? I'm telling them next time, don't take my coat to the 15th of May or the 20th. Because in Colorado, you can get snow on the 15th of May. You just don't know. You go out there one day and say, oh, it's beautiful out here. Wake up in the morning, it's a whole different story. You know, I think, God, what, how in the world are we ever going to have a full life when we got so many things that we've put in the wrong places? You know, it's almost like having a jigsaw puzzle. When I was a girl, I really loved jigsaw puzzles. And, I, and the more complicated they were, the better I liked them. And so... I had one one time that had over 1,000, I think about 1,500 pieces. And I sat down trying to figure out, okay, now it's supposed to be a dog when you're done. And so you got the picture on the, on the front of the puzzle, except you got little pieces like this. How, how are you going to finally put that together? And I stayed with it until I did it. But a lot of people, that's where your life is. You got all these little pieces. John over here, Jenny over there. And this little thing there, and that little thing there. I got all these pieces, but when I try to put them together, it becomes too confusing. I don't know how, I don't know what to do with this. What it, it says it's supposed to be this dog, but how is that? Now the dog is white, and around him is brown and green. You got all these white pieces. Which way do they go? Where how do they fit? That's where your life is. I'm trying to put it together, but it's too many white pieces. It's going to make up this big puzzle. And so I get confused. I, I don't know where one white piece goes over another one. I don't understand it. But if you like challenges such as I did, I thought, boy, this is, this is going to be really a challenge, but a good one. And to finish that was so gratifying. But think about yourself this morning. What in your life are you trying to put together that's never going to fit? Somehow, the pieces that you have don't go in that place in your life. But you keep putting them in there. You have nothing. And you become so frustrated thinking, I thought sure when I got my promotion, I would feel really accomplished. I thought sure when I got my degree in college, I would feel so accomplished. And people get out of college and end up washing dishes and turning hamburgers. They're like, this is not what I went to school for. Yeah, but... When you put all of your trust and confidence in that, you find out it doesn't work. So we sin every day. Every person that has not accepted Jesus, sin every day. But once you accept him, he really does take away the desire to sin. If you're if you a drinker, he takes away alcohol. If you're a smoker, he takes it away. If you're a druggie, he takes it away. We don't want that. We go to rehab. And we come out and we're scared to death. And you got to always admit that you are an alcoholic. So how do I get past this? I go to rehab and they say, you have to deal with the fact that you will always be an alcoholic. You know how miserable that is? I've been to rehab and gone through all these things and all the pain. And I still got to acknowledge to myself, I will always be sick. 
That's nothing to look forward to. Because you don't know what morning you're going to wake up and continue. But when you come to him, you're not always going to be a sinner. When you come to him, he changes that. You're not always a sinner. He makes a difference. He makes a difference. So think about it. Man is a repeat offender. He continues to sin every day. Over and over and over again. And you know what's so crazy about it? Even though you know it's not working, you'll still do it again. I know this is not working. I know getting high is not going to fix it. I know that's not going to work, but I'm going to try it one more time. And you'll keep trying and trying until after a while you need to go to this highest of highs and you can't get there unless you overdose. What a tragedy. People are taking pills for, to get up, taking pills to lay down, taking pills just to stay focused, taking pills, taking pills, taking pills. But when it wears off, we got the same thing. We got an energy drink that we drink at home. It's called Red Bull. I really like Red Bull. I remember getting up the other morning thinking, boy, I'm tired. And I had somewhere to go. I said to my grandson, bring me a Red Bull. I got in the car. I said, whoa, hey, this is what's happening, boy. Hey, I ain't tired no more. Give me that Red Bull. <laughs> But it's only going to last so long. After I get all excited, I'm like, yeah, it's on, boy, it's on. By the time I got back from my appointment, I was sliding right on back down. By the time I got out, I said, I'm tired. Now, you got to stop somewhere. You just can't red bull it all the way. At some point, you got to say, that's enough red bull. But it's amazing. And this is what the world do. They do these things and think, wow, this is great. Why is this great? How are you, John? How are you doing, Susie? Well, in no world, a great place to live. The same person. See him in a few hours. What are you doing here? What's going on with you? You say, you were so I'm not excited now. I got some issues. Everybody's got issues. You see people turn on you, you don't know why they turn. All of a sudden they're talking crazy. One minute they're on a high, the next minute they're just all, all over the place. You want to get like this woman that met Jesus at the well. She went back and told them, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Come see this man. I'm no longer the same person. My life is changed. I am a different person. You want to tell everybody about it. When I first got saved, because I was a terrible girl, cursing and swearing and beating up men and beating up women and carrying a weapon and just stupid. He came into my life. I remember waking up, wake, waking up and saying, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of having to be bad. I'm tired of people saying, you know, that, you know what? Go get Rose. She'll take care of things. I got tired of being the big boy, the big sister, having to take care of everybody's problems, no matter what happened. They said, well, get Rose. My older sister, I said, go get Rose. Well, I got to take care of business if they come and get me. I got to beat up their boyfriends. I got to beat up, I got to beat up these people. I was so tired of beating up people. I was so tired of being mean. I was so tired of being out of control. Thank God I never drank because I had been drinking. I was crazy sober. God forbid I had taken some drinks. And I thought, God, I'm so tired. Sin will make you tired. It'll make you mentally, emotionally, physically drain because it's not good for you. Anything that's not good for you over a period of time began to take a negative effect on your body, on your mind. God, I had, to, I had to find my way to Jesus. 
And since he has now let me see what my problem is when he took away the cloak, look, Rose, this is where your problem is. You're a sinner. You're not going to stop cursing and lying and, and beating up people. You're full of sin. Oh, I got rid of it. I said, oh, no, I ain't living my life like this for forever. I got rid of it. The best day of my life. 50 years ago. Quit letting people tell you that you can't be a Christian. Yes, you can. Because he comes to help you and give you strength. He had to help me. I couldn't help me. I told myself many days, I could have, I'm not fighting the day and I'm not using profanity. As soon as my feet hit the floor, so-and-so, the blankety blank was cussing about nothing. Don't let the dog be done potted on the floor or something. Just, where's that dog? Get out the bed mad with everybody. Feeling like nobody likes me anyway. I guess not. They had fixed it to where if I went to my sister's house, she roomed there with, with a friend. If I went there, they called the police because I was barred from that house. You cannot go to that house. I thought, nobody's going to tell me where I can go and can't go. I'm going there. So I went there to say, talk to my sister about something, and she was scared to open the door. And so I said, Margie, open the door. She said, Rose, get away. Get away from me. You're not supposed to be here. I said, I'm not going anywhere. Open the door. No, I'm not opening the door. Oh, it's like that. I was so out of control. I just kicked the whole thing in. It had a dead boat on that drove door. I kicked it in. And she said, Rose, I'm going to call the police. I don't care who you call. Crazy Annie is here. This mentally deranged fool is here. Crazy. Out of control. See, when I was dating my husband, they were going down, down to Chicago. And they asked me to go. And I said, well, I'll talk to Charles and see what he says. And I, so I said, Charles, I said, they, they're going down to Chicago. I said, what do you think? He said, Ro, you ought not get on that trip. I said, well, yeah, maybe I won't go. He went. He shouldn't have did that. He went to Chicago. So they went out. He was kissing some girl in Chicago. And I said, my sister come back in town and said, yeah, we, we went out and got drunk and all this stuff. And, and everybody was hugged up and kissing each other. And Charles, some girl was there. He was kissing her. I said, he did? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I called my husband up. His dad owned a, a barbecue place in St. Louis, but he was over in the, in the restaurant next to his daddy's place, and he was helping track over there. And so I called him up on the phone. I said, Charles, I said, I'm on my way out there. I said, I want you to come outside as soon as I get there. I was just as calm and cr crazy calm. So I said, I need to talk to you. He said, he said what's it about? I said, I'll tell you when I get there. So I got me a knife. And I thought, I'm going to fix you. Next time you kiss somebody, you'll think three or four times. I'm going to fix you. What I'd like to do is fix you where you can't never kiss again. But I'll leave something in case, uh, in case it's me and you. <laughs> I don't want to cut off my nose spite my own face. So I go out to Trax Restaurant. When I get out there, my sister calls her, Rose is on her way out there, boy. She is mad. So I get there, and he looks through the window. I said, he's sitting back there saying, <laughs> <laughs> so I just get saying, come here. 
He said, not coming out there. So I got on the phone. I said, you got a problem? He said, Rose, I'm not coming out there. Lord, you already told me you got a knife and you were coming to get me. I'm not coming outside this restaurant. I told him, I said, I just want to talk to you. I'm going to have a talk with a knife. Crazy. Deep inside, I really didn't want to be the way I was. You said, well, what made you that way? Sin did it. I thought, him, get rid of him to a point. Just let him know you've been there. You don't really have to just get rid of him totally because I did love him. <laughs> we ain't taking no play stuff. Now that's not going to happen. He knew I meant business. He knew it. That's why he said, I'm coming out. I thought, okay. I finally cooled down some and went on home. Because he wasn't coming out, and I wasn't going in Tracks Restaurant and, and make a scene. I wasn't going to do that even as bad as I was. But let me tell you, I got so tired of feeling like I had to defend my position, defend myself. Uh, I got to be a certain way, and, and this is how people know who I am and all this crap. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm so tired of Rose, so tired of Rose. Please change me. Put in my heart to do what's right. Take away the hate and the meanness and all the things that I don't like. Take it away. Make me a new person. Give me the power to say no. I cried out to God, help me. I can't help myself. Help me. I've tried it. You may have tried it. You may have said, I'm going to get it right. I'm going to give my life to God. I'm going to go to church and get it together. You may have tried it. He said, Sister Rose, it doesn't work. Every time I think I'm going to get on track and do this, I find myself back at the same starting point. Jesus will meet you there if you mean it. He'll change your life. He'll take away the sin, the heartache, the pain. And let me tell you, in this world, you can get a lot of pain. A lot of suffering. But if you can go to him and say, God, just fix me. Help me to be the person you want me to be. Little did I know he would call me to preach. That's the last thing on my mind. Preach? No. That couldn't happen. First of all, I couldn't talk. I couldn't. I was a great stutterer. I couldn't say two words. It took me 5, 10, 15 minutes to get out a word. Called me to preach? Yes, he did. He sent me for you and for you and for you. For you. To tell you if you want out, you can get out. But you don't have no excuse to keep sinning. Well, I can't, I, I can't do it. He knew that. He knew we couldn't do it by ourselves. That's why he sent his son. So look at your life and say, you know what? I really don't have an excuse. And he sees you no matter where you are. He already knew that Adam and Eve had, had broken the law and didn't do what he said. When he came to, to spend time with them, they, they removed themselves. What do you do? You remove yourself from things that are good and rather put your life in, and, your situ, and, and yourself in places that are not good for you. And in the long run, you, you, make, you, you come to the, uh, to the conclusion, I should have never took that, took that road. It was a bad road. And boy, are you paying the price for it. Some roads we take in our life, they last for the rest of your life. No matter how you try to get it together, the only person who can get you out is God. But you can be gotten out. You can change things with him. He can do it. If he could take the worst of the worst, which was me, and say, Rose, I, I want you for me. And I said, yes, Lord. I'll go if you're looking for somebody. I'll go. And I'll tell it when nobody else is telling it. And I'll speak it when nobody else is speaking it. And I'll stand when nobody else is standing with me. Because all I needed to know was what he wanted me to do. I got my life on track. The depression left. The unhappiness left. 
Everything that could have made my life miserable, I dumped it all. See, you know what you do? You come to Jesus and you keep something back in the boat. Take it all out. Throw it overboard. I don't need none of it. Because it's not going to work anything good for you. See? He said, I fixed it. So now, whatever thing you say, well, the reason why I'm not a Christian because I really can't give up the drugs. I really can't stop the alcohol. I really can't stop being who I am. I really can't stop this bitterness and hatred that I have in my heart. Oh, yes, you can with him. No excuse will you ever be able to use in his presence and it be accepted. You can do it if nobody in your family ever did it. You can do it if your friend says, I don't want any parts of it. Don't be swayed by people, but make up in your mind, I can be different if I want to be. And I'm not going to offer these reasons why I'm a failure. Moses said, he said, God, you want me to go down and talk to Pharaoh? He said, I can't even talk. Can you imagine God sending you to the king, Herod back, Michael? Message good for you. <laughs> he always exits by the time the, he, the, uh, the work gets kind of hot. He takes an exit. He'll be back in a minute. He loves to dance. The word just can't, he can't hardly handle it, but he's a good guy. I'm going to do my best to help him. See? But Jesus said, now that you know that you're messed up, now that you know you need a Savior, now that you know things are in a bad shape, I fixed it for you. I already took care of all of it. When he went to Calvary, he covered it all for all of us. And as a result of that, we're out. As a result of that, I'm out. As a result of that, my children are out. As a result of that, my husband was out. He served 20 plus years in the military and um, was a great soldier. Passed away 22 years ago. Had a great marriage. 34 years. With one man. Loved him. Loved God the most. Loved him second. And what's wrong with us? We're always loving everybody else before God. When you put that out of position, it doesn't work. But when you put God here, and my wife here, and my children here, and my career here, things flow. You know what we do? We always put it in the wrong place and wonder why it doesn't work. It's not going to work until you put it in order. God said, I want to be first in your life, number one. And if I'm not number one, I'm not going to work for you. You're not going to put me in the back seat and while you drive and run off the road constantly. Put me in the front seat, and I'll take control. And I'll direct your life. And I'll help you to get where you need to be. I'll be there for you. I'll be loving you. No matter what happens in your life. I'm with you always. And I'll never leave you or forsake you. See, if my husband was all that I had, I wouldn't have survived. We had a great marriage. This is the man I was going to beat up that went to Chicago. We had a great marriage. Yes. And raised our children in church, done the right thing. He wants to help you. Because you can say, well, I got this reason. I got that reason. This is the reason I can't do it. This is the reason you can't do it. No, it's not good enough. Make up in your mind, look, I got to get through this. I want to live my life happy. I look at people sometimes and I think, you know how short life is? It's very short. If you live to be 100 years old, you've lived a short time. I was laying in my bed this morning looking at the clock. And I, I don't know, just watching it for a minute. And I, I was watching the second hand go around and how fast that hour hand moved. But if you're not paying attention to it sometimes, you don't realize it's moving. But it's going, it looks slow, but it's very fast. And I kept looking at it and I thought every time that uh, uh, second hand went around, that, that hand was moving with it. It's like that. That's where your life is. And at some point, some hour, some day, it's going to be your time. What are you going to say to God? Well, I didn't know. I didn't think it would work. I tried this and I tried that. No, he's not going to accept excuses. Because I don't care what you try. Try him and let him be the center of your life. And he will make the difference in your life. <laughs> Nothing's too hard for him. The most complicated people in the world is different when God comes into their life.
could never believe I was a mean person and honorary and all those things because I love people with a passion. I love them. I preach this gospel so because I love them. I'm trying to keep you from a place that you don't want to go. You don't want to go to hell. Hell's a horrible place. If I can somehow give you the message that says there's a way out, you don't have to sit back and say it won't work for me. God is no respecter person. What he did for one person, he'll do it for the other. So he's not a respecter person. He'll work it out for you. He did for me. He changed my life forever. I never dreamed I could get up one day and never say a curse word, and it lasts for 51 years. It ain't that you forgot how to curse. The fact is you don't curse. So if you get upset about something, you don't let profanity roll out, calling it French. The French would be offended at you. You're going to say that's French, what you just said? Come on. You're sitting there this morning saying, Sister Rose, I know there was some reason I came here today. Don't push it away. See, I really do need to get my life right. I need to get it on track. I know now what's the problem in my marriage, in our relationship. I know why there's always some type of turmoil going on in my life. Seemingly, I can't put the fire out. Come to him. Give him a chance. He'll make your life so happy. I'm happy every day. Every day. And I didn't know if I could stay this happy with Charles gone out of my life. But rest assured, that's the only person that can do it. It's the only person. Then a 29-year-old daughter died four years later. God makes the difference. You can get through anything, and God can pull you through anything if you will hold on to the pull. Don't turn it loose. See, if he could do it for her, maybe you wouldn't like me. Maybe you wouldn't like the next person over here, but you had some issues. Today, you can resolve them. You can start a brand new life. How wonderful it is to have this kind of life, to be fulfilled and happy. While our musicians and singers are coming, I say to you this morning, without a doubt, he makes the difference in your life. He can make you happy because I look at this audience, I see some people, they don't look very happy. Like I made it here this morning, but you know, I, life sucks. It don't have to suck. You can change sucking. You can change that. Right. You know what? I think I'm going to be happy. I told my daughter one day, she saved, but she, she was teasing when she did it. And I said, I said, just be happy. She said, I ain't being happy today. No, be happy. And then she bust out laughing and said, yeah, I am. You know what? You choose how you wake up every morning on how good your day going to be or how bad it's going to be, depending on whether God's in your life or not. If he's in your life, hey, you got it going on. If he ain't, the least thing happens, just turn you upside down. People just lose it. They're out of control. He wants to bring it in control. I told my kids, I said, I'm so glad I was saved when I had y'all. Mm. Uh, if you've done something I didn't want you to have, that was all uh, you didn't, I, wouldn't, I didn't want you to do, you were done. Thank God he saved me. He spared your life. <laughs> I was crazy. My kids said, Mama, I'm glad we didn't know you then. I said, uh, you're right. You're right. Because you, you make me mad, you don't want to do that. And my kids have made me mad at times, crazy things they've done. But I, I stayed in control. And I knew before that, that wasn't going to happen. You did what? You did what? <laughs> Thank God for salvation. Sometimes when people would treat me bad after I got saved, because I never took nothing off nobody, and after I got saved, uh, I knew I couldn't fight no more and curse people out and beat them up. And sometimes, boy, that took something. And I said, you better be glad I'm saved. 
Whoever you are, you better be glad Jesus came into my heart. Because that's what keeps me from doing it wrong. That's right. You want to make it this morning? You can. This is a great life. You'll never find it better. You'll never find anything else in the world that is a substitute for what I got and what you can have. That's 